Hello and welcome to the Revelation class. We are on chapter 19. We have almost come to the end of the book. Thank you for persevering, continuing to study with me. And we have three more chapters to go. We are on session 28. If you are watching this series for the first time, I would recommend that you watch the previous sessions to have a better context of what we are studying tonight. So with that said, so let's continue chapter 19. So before we go there, let me give you a little background where we are. In chapter 12, we studied a sign appeared in heaven, which is very important in the book of Revelation. And the woman uh, having the stars on her head and um, she is pregnant and there is a dragon. So we studied all that in session 21. And we identified the woman as nation Israel. So that is very important and key factor for understanding the book of Revelation. Many times people uh, associate this woman with the church and things like that. So that is uh, a wrong interpretation because uh, when we look at Daniel, the study that we did before studying Revelation, we have the 70 weeks of Daniel and the 70th week is to deal with Israel. So God is very clear on what he is doing. So 69 weeks and then the 70th week between we have the church age. So we need to be very clear on identifying these uh, terms. And in chapter 13, we studied the beast coming out of the sea. We identified this uh, Antichrist uh, and we also studied about the spirit of Antichrist and the false religion and the uh, person Antichrist. And of course, we don't know who the person is to give a name, but we have identified all the characteristics of that person, the beast. And also we looked at the tale of two cities. So the very big contrast, the great city Jerusalem, of, of course, uh, shown as the bride of Christ. And uh, we studied the Babylon the Great, which is the harlot. So one side you have the bride of Christ, on the other side you have the Babylon the Great. So the lamb's wife, and the other side you see the great harlot that rides the beast, um, the Satan. And you saw that uh, the bride of Christ on a great and high mountain coming down from heaven, having the glory of God. On the other side you see uh, uh, it's on the wilderness or a desert, sits on many waters. It's an uh, it's earthly a false religion having all blasphemous names uh, destined for uh, destruction. And we studied the destruction of this Babylon uh, in the last class, in the last week. And also we studied three women. Uh, the woman of Revelation 12, we just uh, studied about that, alluded to the pregnant woman that's the wife of the Lord or the nation Israel. And the bride of Christ in the church. And the last woman is the harlot associated with uh, Satan or the mystery Babylon. So I'm just skimming through this because we studied all these details uh, in the previous sessions. So the key signature I want to remind everyone every time when we study the book of Revelation is this is the very key signature because most of the time when you read some commentaries or listen to some preachers about identifying who this um, uh, the mystery Babylon Many times they go and identify it as Rome or Roman Catholic Church and things like that. But I want to uh, want you to pay key attention here. Who is a liar who, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. So that is very uh, important. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So with all that said, when we identified all these details, so all the signatures, uh, the, the people putting, uh, throwing dust on them when they, when they are crying or when they are lamenting, and also uh, the person who denies the sun. So we identified it as Islam. Islam closely matches with all that. And also uh, here uh, you have Islam unequivocally denies the father and the son. Quran, uh, Surah 4, 171 and uh, Surah 1935, Islam unequivocally uh, denies the father and the son. So the three main contenders, if you want to identify, so these are the three main uh, contenders people will usually identify with the mystery Babylon. 
So you could say Babylon in Iraq literally, but uh, the word of God says it's a mystery Babylon, not Babylon. It's a mystery Babylon. So the other contenders usually people will go with Rome, Italy. And then, of course, we identified based on all the signatures. You need to watch the previous sessions. So how we concluded uh, to that. So we identified it as Mecca, Saudi Arabia. Um, so here is a picture. The woman sits on many waters and also people from all nations and all tongues. People will gather here to worship the Kaaba stone. Um, and we looked at that and also the city uh, as Mecca, Saudi Arabia. Here is a person uh, kissing the stone uh, on the Kaaba, Kaaba stone. So here in Revelation 18, last week we studied, For in one hour such great riches came to nothing. Every shipmaster, all who traveled by ships, sailors, and as many as trade on the sea, stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like this great city? We studied and we identified how this city and the false religion is going to be um, uh, judged. And also we alluded to, based on our understanding and some scriptures from Old Testament, there is a scroll um, that was set up and then that was a flying scroll. And we identified probably that would be a nuclear weapon or something. Something is going to uh, destroy this uh, mystery Babylon. Here, when that happens, the whole world mourns. We studied in the last uh, uh, chapter why the whole world mourns because they do the imports and exports and they do a lot of trading with this particular uh, city or the state. So here when that happens they threw dust on their heads. So this is another signature I told you because if it is Rome they would not do this. So this that is why it has to be it is a Middle Eastern custom. And here in verse 19 it says they threw dust on their heads and cried out weeping and wailing and saying alas alas that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth for in one hour she is made desolate. So Revelation 18:19 we studied that last week. So at the end, rejoice over her, O heaven, and O holy prophet, apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. So today, you know, people may think, what is God doing when they are killing, you know, uh, the Christians, beheading Christians and all that. But there is going to be a day God is going to judge. And on that day, this is what is going to happen. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you, holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. So God is going to judge uh, on that day. And on that day, it is going to be like this. Verse 21. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into a sea. So if uh, imagine yourselves, if you if somebody takes a great millstone, that's a very big one, throw it into a sea, what happens? There's going to be a big splash and the whole stone going to go down deep into the water. So it is going to be something like that. That's what the angel is saying. So then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus, with violence, the great city of Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found anymore. So if you imagine if you throw a great millstone into a sea, what happens? You can't find it. It just goes down, down deep into the sea. So, um, so here that is what the picture was given to us. Thus, with violence, the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found anymore. So when this happens, when the judgment happens, that is what is going to happen. On that day, the sound of the harpists, musicians, Flutists and the trumpeters shall not be heard in you anymore. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you anymore. And the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you anymore. So when you have a, some kind of a nuclear explosion or a bomb or something of that magnitude, we don't know exactly, but we based on all the scriptures as I explained last week, if something happens like that, you won't find anybody there because everything will be burned. The city is burned. We saw the shipmasters standing afar off, crying and lamenting because this whole city is burning. Such thing can happen only when there is some kind of an explosion or something. So when that happens, that is, this is what happens. The sound of the harpists, the musicians, flutists and the trumpeters shall not be heard in you anymore because there will not be any people in that city anymore there. That's what the idea. The light of the lamp shall not shine in you anymore. 
and the voice of the bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you any more. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. So we have seen this because they were doing all kinds of trading and also imports and exports, not only goods but also human souls, meaning people, meaning they're importing people to, uh, under the guise of employment, but there are a lot of people were like slaves in that uh, area. So we studied all that in the last session. So here it says, the light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and saints and of all who were slain on the earth. This is the reason why God is judging this particular false religion or false um, place of worship because it has killed the prophets and the saints. So that is the why God is going to judge um, them. So the, uh, Jesus explained this tribulation. So sometimes when we talk about tribulation and all that, people will always think, the, oh, this is the book of Revelation. Not necessarily. So when we look at Matthew chapter 24, here Jesus is talking about tribulation. So let me take you to a few scriptures there. Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So the disciples were very curious asking Jesus, Jesus, tell us what's the sign of your coming? So they were talking to Jesus. So that is not about the first coming. So definitely it is about the second coming. So they were asking, what is the sign of your coming, second coming? And of the end of the age. And they clearly understood it's going to, everything is going to end. So they were asking Jesus about that. And in verse 4, Jesus said, and Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. So uh, this is a very important point that we need to understand. Uh, every time we see how many times we have seen this uh, phrase, don't be deceived, do not be deceived. So even Jesus is saying here, take heed that no one deceives you because deception is going to be all time high. People will be deceived. Literally, people will be deceived. They are following, they are thinking that they are, they are on their way to heaven. But of course, they are on their broad way. Uh, none of them are going to heaven. So that is why Jesus is clearly saying, take heed that no one deceives you. How can we not be deceived? Only by abiding in the word of God. Only by interpreting the word of God carefully. You know, you may be studying the word of God, but if you are not interpreting the scriptures properly, you may be on the broad way. So that is why it is very important for us to pay close attention to what Jesus said. So, so I don't have time to go into all those details, but you need to be very careful in, in, in interpreting the scriptures. But there is prosperity gospel. There is all kinds of gospel these days. So if you see those kinds of things, you need to stay away from those. Take up the cross and follow me, Jesus said. So be careful. So verse 5, For many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and will deceive many. So the deception is all time high and even people will come and say, I am Christ and people will follow that person. And especially during the time of tribulation, we see Antichrist coming and saying, I am the Christ and people will follow him and will deceive many. And in verse 6, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So when you see all these things happening, that means we are very close. So And this will happen like a birth pangs. You know, birth pangs, Jesus talked about it is like, you know, the frequency and the intensity will keep on increasing. So the frequency, that means that these events you will hear very frequently. And also every time when these things happen, the intensity also will be high. And there will be famines. And recently I was reading an article about uh, Africa. And uh, there is so much of famine. You know, some of these news, they won't report even the things that are happening. But if you really look at all the worldwide, what is going on, there is already there's famines going on. And of course, COVID-19, we are seeing a pestilence right in front of us uh, with the different strains, even Omicron. 
and earthquakes in various places and there are uh, these are things happening right in front of us i am not saying this is all the end but these are the things that are happening and then keep on happening the more frequency so that is what a birth birth pangs means the intensity and the frequency will be uh, increasing verse 8 all these are the beginning of sorrows so when you see all these things that means that these are the beginning of sorrows in verse 9 then they will deliver you to up to tribulation and kill you and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake and then many will be offended will betray one another and will hate one another then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many again talking about deception and uh, you know if you are a christian and if you want to follow christ you will be hated by the nations for your for uh, god's name's sake because they hate the bible because they hate god's instructions that's why they hate you so that is the reason why they hate christians because uh, they hate god and they hate god's word and because lawlessness will abound and uh, love of many will grow cold but he who endures to the end shall be saved and this verse is very clear here in it says and because lawlessness will abound the love of many will grow cold right in front of our eyes if you turn on your tv and if you watch any news channels or newspapers what is going on lawlessness and you know in the past people the the preachers used to preach against adultery or fornication you know so slowly you are not hearing those terms anymore you know why so the the media uh, and also the culture has changed the terms instead of saying adultery they know what they'll say they'll say they have an affair or something you know so the change the vocabulary you know, because they want to get passed by so they don't want to address the seriousness and recently the whole media is now coming up with a new term you know what that is smash and grab robberies you know why they are using that they want to replace the term looting they don't want to use looting anymore so now what they are coming up with is smash and grab so lawlessness will abound they don't even want to acknowledge that it is uh, lawlessness or sinful so they change the terms now instead of adultery they start already started using affairs and now the new term come up with smash and grab robberies don't want to use looting anymore so this is what lawlessness looks like so lawlessness will abound the love of many will grow cold therefore when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by daniel the prophet standing in the holy place whoever reads let him understand then let those who are in judea flee to the mountains this is jesus describing what the the tribulation looks like and he is explaining and he is saying in the middle of the tribulation you are going to see this this particular event that is spoken by daniel the prophet what is that you see the abomination of desolation spoken by daniel the prophet standing in the holy place that means there will be a temple and in the in the middle of that tribulation antichrist will go and sit in the temple of god set up an image of himself uh, that is the abomination of desolation spoken by daniel the prophet so jesus is saying when you see this thing then flee i already explained where the jewish people need to flee to some places like petra or something into the mountains that's what it says here so then let those who are in judea flee to the mountains because the persecution the tribulation is going to be all time high the second part of the tribulation is usually called the great tribulation let him who is on the house top not go down to take anything out of his house because there is not enough time for you to do that you need to run the moment you see the antichrist sitting in the temple of god you need to run or setting an image in the holy of holies declaring himself as god you need to run if you are on the house top you don't have time to go down and pack your bags you need to run verse 18 and let him who is in the field not go back and get his clothes so there is no time for you to uh, pack your bags verse 19 but o to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days and pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the sabbath 
So clearly, Jesus is talking about the Jewish people. Many of them will be still following the Sabbath. So Jesus is saying, pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath because it is very difficult for them, especially if they are pregnant um, uh, or if it is a Sabbath, they cannot travel and things like that. So the point is when this happens, people have to flee. Verse 21, for then there will be a great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. You know, Holocaust will be like, in comparison, it will pale with what is going to happen here. Unfortunately, that is going to happen again. That is what Jesus is saying. For then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever will be. It's, a very, it's going to be very sad during this time. Verse 22, And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So that is why God has laid out in His plan, it is seven years, not more than that. Because if, he, if he, God has allowed more than seven years, nobody would survive because Antichrist is going to pursue after them. So that is why clearly it says, unless those days were shortened, that is why God has shortened. So the great tribulation is only three and a half years, 160 days, even the days were mentioned. So that is all uh, it was set forth for this time. So the great tribulation is only three and a half years. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ or there do not believe. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So one of the things that people will look for those days is the Bible. You know, so when these things happen, they will realize, yes, Bible is coming. You know, all the prophecies are getting fulfilled. And here Jesus is saying, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders, if possible, even the elect. So I have told you beforehand. God is saying, I have told you beforehand because that is why we have all these things written in the scriptures. If somebody comes to you and say, hey, here is Christ. There is Christ. You know, the second coming has uh, happened. So don't believe the false prophets. Don't go out. If you go out, they will kill you because during this time, people will be hiding away from Antichrist. And if somebody comes and tells you that Jesus Christ has come, don't go out because that is the trick that Antichrist is going to play. So don't believe the false prophets. And Jesus Christ is going to say how he's going to come back anyway. In verse 26 it says, Therefore, if they say to you, Look, here he is in the desert, do not go out, or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. So again you see that it, uh, the word here has come back, look, he is in the desert. So that is the desert, the Mecca, the area that we studied so far in the last few sessions. So Jesus is saying, therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, don't go there. He is in the inner rooms, don't believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, how long that takes? It just takes a second. For a lightning comes from east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So God's coming is like that. So when people say all kinds of things, don't believe that. So verse 28. For whenever the carcass is there, the eagles will be gathered together. So God is saying that when this happens, everybody will be um, uh, informed. So you don't have to worry about believing the false prophets. Because for as lightning, it takes just a, a fraction of a second. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So the point I'm trying to make here is we studied Revelation. We studied about the beast coming out of the sea, the beast coming out of the earth, the Antichrist and all that, the tribulation, and now the mark of the beast, 666 and all that. But my point is Jesus has already described how this is going to happen with the, in Matthew chapter 24. So we need to be careful about that. And now with that said, now we come to chapter 19. In chapter 19, we are going to see Jesus Christ coming back. So all the things that we talked about, the Babylon, the judgment on the Babylon and all that we have seen. So now we come to a different chapter after these things. After what things? After these things, that whatever we have studied so far, all the judgments, all the things, all the seven uh, trumpets, the seven bowls, seven seals, all these after all these things, 
Now, here John says, After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, He heard a loud voice because why great multitude in heaven? So almost pretty much everybody in heaven is saying this now. What are they saying? Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. So in heaven, after the judgment of this mystery Babylon, after the judgment of the false religion, so now the whole heaven is rejoicing. So what are they saying? Alleluia! Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. Many times we say this word Alleluia. Sometimes people don't even know what the meaning is. But they just say it. Hallelujah, hallelujah. But what does it mean? Actually the Alleluia is a Greek word. Uh, Alleluia. It is only used four times in the New Testament. So it is meaning praise the Lord. In fact, that Greek word is actually because the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. So you will find only four times mentioned in the whole Bible. Uh, Alleluia. Uh, the Greek Alleluia is meaning praise the Lord. So next time when you say Alleluia, what it means is praise the Lord. So but the, the Hebrew word, it is from actually a Hebrew origin, of course. But in Hebrew... It is, not a, it is not a single word, it is like this. Uh, halal meaning um, um, the praise, and then El is usually used for God, and then Yah, Yah is representing Yahweh. So Halal, Yah, so if you break that into three different words, what it is saying is again praise God Jehovah. Praise God Jehovah, that means it is Hallelujah. But that word praise the Lord, of that phrase is used in different combinations 165 times. And um, so it is basically praise the Lord. So next time when you say hallelujah, it is praise the Lord. Again, sometimes we say amen. What does it mean? So it is again a Greek word. If you use Greek amen, it is used 152 times. So meaning is so be it. So uh, Jesus used this very often saying, Verily, verily, I say unto you. That means, Amen, Amen. That means, of a true, this is what he is confirming or uh, saying. So be it. So that is what Amen means. So when you hear somebody saying a prayer, and then at the end you say, I agree with that. So be it. So that's what you say. So uh, that is what Amen means. So the reason I am bringing those meanings is because here in this chapter, in uh, those four times that Alleluia is used, all of those four instances are used in chapter 19. So that is why I'm explaining the meaning here. So in verse 2, For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. So this is the reason why God is judging this for this uh, uh, harlot, the false religion, because uh, this false religion has promoted uh, false um, religion to everybody, all the nations, and people started worshipping. And that is why here God says, He has avenged on her the blood of His servants shed by her. In promoting this false religion, they have killed Christians, millions of Christians. So that is the reason here. Um, clearly we studied about this in the last session as well. Verse 3. Again they said, Alleluia. Our smoke rises up forever and ever. So, And then this is the second time if you, if you are counting Alleluia. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who sat on the throne saying, I am Amen. Alleluia. This is the third time again. So uh, the point is the whole heaven is rejoicing at this fact now because it has now come to an end. The, the world system is being judged. The world, the false religion is judged. God is going to come back to earth to set up his millennial kingdom. So the whole heaven is rejoicing. Alleluia. In verse 5, Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him both small and great. So you, you read this uh, Revelation 19, it, for several verses it is all about praising God. All these 24 elders, the angels, everybody is praising. And in verse 6 again, And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thunderings saying, Alleluia! This is the fourth time if you are tracking 
This is the fourth time. For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. So everybody is rejoicing. So the whole heaven is rejoicing. The 24 elders rejoicing. The living creatures rejoicing. Some of your translation says the beasts. But as I said, as I explained earlier in chapter 4, it is actually the living creatures, not the beasts. Because the beasts, the term is used for the Antichrist and the false prophets and all that. So I don't want to use that translation beasts for the heavenly living creatures. And in verse 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. So now we have come to the end of all this whole thing and then the marriage of the Lamb. So John, of course, you know John, the apostle who wrote the Gospel of John. He is the one writing the Revelation. He uses uh, uh, the term lamb for referring to Jesus Christ. So that is why he's saying for the marriage of, instead of saying for the marriage of Jesus Christ, he's saying for the marriage of the lamb has come. And again, if you remember, behold the lamb of God. The reason why he is using the lamb is, of course, you know that it is a sacrificial animal and it is used for atonement for our sins. So Jesus Christ is the lamb of God who died in place of a lamb, sacrificial lamb, he himself gave his life. So that is the reason why he is using the lamb in, in all these uh, chapters. So it says, for the marriage of the lamb has come. Who is his wife now? Then if we are marrying, so who, who is his wife? And his wife is the church, the bride of Christ. Remember, the church is the bride of Christ. So this is going to be a very big occasion. You know, you can imagine yourself, you know, if we are going to get married, it's going to be a big case. So and now... Here you are going to get married with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and that is what it is all about. So the, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. How does this wife has made herself ready? Because the you know the saints repented of their sins and asked Jesus Christ for forgiveness, and they become the child of God, and that is how they become the part of the church, and that is how they become uh, the bride of Christ. Verse 8, And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is what? Righteous acts of the saints. So it is not our own righteousness, but imputed righteousness. So let me explain what that means. When Christ died on the cross, he took our sins on, upon him. So God laid all our sins, all our shame, all our um, sins upon Christ on the cross he imputed his righteousness to us. So now because of his imputed righteousness, when God looks at us, he looks at us as righteous. So and that righteousness represents a fine linen garments here. So that is what it is. Verse 8, and to her, that's the bride of Christ, uh, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Verse 9, then he said to me, write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Of course, you are blessed. If you are, if you are there in this marriage celebration, you are blessed. So blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. So always whenever you see this, that means this is going to happen. So people, you know, may have all kinds of doubts about it. But John is saying, no, these are the true sayings of God. So there's going to be a marriage. I am actually looking for this. You know, I don't know when it's going to happen, but I am already looking for this. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So that is the blessed hope for us. You know, we may go through tribulations. We may go through sickness. We may go through sorrow and all that going on right now. But if you are a child of God, let me assure you, you are blessed. Because God is saying, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And you are going to be with Him forever and ever. So that is the blessing that we have. And in fact, remember Jesus told His disciples, I'm going to go to prepare a place for you. And when I prepare a place for you, I'm going to come back. That is what He's talking about here. And now when you come to verse 10, and I fell at His feet to worship Him. But He said to me, see that you do not do that. So here, what is John doing? So John, of course, is looking uh, at uh, the, all these visions. And now he fell 
at the feet of this angel and started worshipping because he saw this glorious, magnificent angel and he started worshipping. And what is the response? But he said to me, see that you, you do not do that. You know, because angels don't like to be worshipped except Lucifer. Lucifer wanted to be worshipped, then that's why he, she, uh, Lucifer fell. But a true angel of God will always say, see, don't worship me. I am, a f I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. So don't do that. Don't worship. And it clearly says, worship God. So a true angel, a true believer, a true pastor, a true man of God will always say, worship God, not worship me. But if somebody says, oh, come and worship me, that means that's the spirit of Lucifer. Clearly, you can see the spirit of Lucifer if somebody is getting all the worship towards them. So here this angel is saying, see that you do not do that, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So here again highlighting the importance of prophetic scriptures. So the, the God's word of course is all um, important. But again here he's uh, highlighting the importance of the prophetic scriptures. Here in Acts chapter 1 we are given the uh, picture how Jesus ascended up into heaven. And in Acts chapter 1 it says, Now when he had spoken these things, of course this is all after resurrection. So you remember Jesus was crucified, died on the cross, and then he rose again on the third day. And he appeared to all his disciples and to the people for 40 days. And after all that, and that is where we pick up the story. Now when he had spoken these things, while they were watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. So this is the ascension. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So here is the, uh, the assurance that how Jesus was taken up into heaven, he's going to come back the same way. In, uh, and he's going to stand his feet on the Mount of Olives. So that is the message here we see in Acts chapter 1. The same way he was taken up, he's going to come back. Now when he has spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, and he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. And 29, Matthew, again going back to Matthew chapter 24, immediately after tribulation. So, you know, so far we studied the passage about the tribulation, so how it is going to be. Immediately after the tribulation, this is what's going to happen. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. So think about this, the whole world going dark. There's no light, no sunlight. And, you know, so everything was shaken. So people were trembling and at that time, God is going to appear. In verse 30, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So when is God, when is God going to come back? Jesus Christ is going to come back? When these things happen, when the sun is darkened and the moon will not give light, the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Why? Because they have taken the mark of the beast. That is why they are now mourning because now they, are, they, are, they see that Jesus Christ is coming back. He's going to come and judge. And also Jesus gives a parable here. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and put forth the leaves, you know the summer is near, right? So when you look at a tree, when you especially look at a fig tree, here as Jesus said, it, when it puts forth leaves, then that means oh, summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. So Jesus is saying, when you see so many things, he has described so many things, events happening, especially the abomination of desolation. So whoever sees that, that particular event, the abomination of desolation and all the things following that, 
that generation will not pass away. So that's what Jesus is saying here. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. So whoever sees these the events happening, uh, uh, especially the event that Jesus highlighted, the abomination of desolation, that means Antichrist will set up his image in the Holy of Holies and force everybody to worship him. And whenever you see those things happening, thus this generation will by no means pass away till all these things takes place. Verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Matthew 24, 32 to 35. And in Isaiah, so when Jesus Christ comes back, he is going to judge. We studied this a little bit in the previous chapters, but the first thing he is going to come back, he is going to clean up the mess. So he is going to judge the whole nations here. So in verse 3, Isaiah 11, 3 says, His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by hearing of his ears. But how is he going to judge? But with righteousness he shall judge the poor. So he is going to judge, but he is a righteous God, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. You know, people will gather together to fight against Jesus Christ. And how is God, Jesus Christ going to fight back? With just a word. So he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips, he shall slay the wicked. So he's just going to say a word. Phew, that's it. So everybody is going to go away. So although they may come up with all the military weapons and tanks and all kinds of things. And he is going to end with the breath of his lips. He shall slay the wicked. This is Isaiah prophesying. So way back when, so 750 years even before the birth of Jesus Christ, Isaiah writing all these details about the second coming and how Jesus Christ is going to judge. In verse 5, righteousness shall be the belt of his loins and faithfulness the belt of his waist. So God is righteous. God is faithful. He is going to judge according to his righteousness. So a lot of times people get confused with these two events. The one is rapture and the second one is the second coming. And sometimes they bundle up these two things and then they don't know where to put all these verses together. So in the Bible, clearly the scripture is very clear, defining, declaring two different events here. So one is rapture. Christ comes for his bride, the church. And the second, in the second coming, Christ comes with his bride. If you read the rest of the chapters 19, 20, 21, you see John was told, look up here, I will show you the bride of Christ. And he saw the, the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. So that means the bride is already up in heaven when he's, the, the bride is coming down in the second coming. So in the rapture, the church is taken up. In the second coming, the church is coming back. So Christ comes for his bride, the church, in rapture. In the second coming, Christ comes with his bride. Christ will not descend on the earth. In the first rapture, Christ will not come on the earth. Because the Bible, you read the scriptures in 1 Thessalonians, in uh, Corinthians, it says, the Lord will meet them in the air. In the twinkling of an eye, you will be raptured. You will be all caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. So the, the, the verses are very clear that we will be caught up. We will get the glorified body. We will go meet the Lord in the air. That is the rapture. In the second coming, Christ will descend to the Mount of Olives. Because there are other passages clearly says that. And rapture could occur at any moment. You know, even before I finish my lecture... You know, the rapture could happen and poof, you know, so you'll be left with, you know, so just the microphone here. The second coming occurs clearly after seven years of tribulation. You can you can actually count when the even there is a mid correction, you know, when the Antichrist goes and set up his image, that's the abomination of desolation. That's the midpoint. And after that, three and a half years and then comes the second coming. So second coming, pretty much we know when it is going to happen. Because there are so many passages, explains, gives the timeline. The second coming will occur after seven years of tribulation, after three and a half years of the abomination of desolation. So we know the second timeline on that. But the rapture could happen any moment. Christ brings a blessing for his saints. When the rapture happens, as we studied, there's going to be, you know, the, the bima seat, we call it. That means when we all go up to meet Christ, we will be rewarded. We will receive our rewards. 
but on the second uh, on the second coming christ brings judgment for those who rejected him so these two events are very specific different events so don't get confused with this uh, otherwise you know you don't know where to place some verses so um, that is why it is very important there anyway going back to revelation chapter 19 verse 11 now i saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called what faithful and true that's his name so you know he is faithful so you don't have to worry about you know when god promises something you don't have to worry about him he is faithful and he is true and in righteousness he judges and makes war so sometimes we may not understand why this happened to this person and whatever you know sometimes we have a lot of questions but you know in the end i just rest on him and in his promises because he is faithful and he is just and whatever god does he knows what he is doing i may not understand at this time i may not have answers to some of those things that are happening around me at this time but one thing is for certain it says and he who sat on him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war so whatever jesus christ is going to do he is going to do it in righteousness i just want to bring another passage because we just read he is riding he is coming back on a white horse but we studied another white horse earlier revelation chapter 6 verse 2 and look and behold a white horse he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer who is this white uh, rider on the white horse then so that time when we studied revelation 6 we clearly identified because the, the, he is in a bad company of course we saw the other horses you know the rider on the red horse and the black horse the green horse so the death the plague the famine all those things associated with that group of all the four horsemen so the rider on the white horse in chapter 6 is antichrist we identified that earlier sometimes people when they see a rider on the white horse they get you know mistaken and calls this revelation 6 rider as jesus christ to no. know but in islam if you read their writings if they if you read their uh, uh, hadith and other things they actually quote as mentioned in revelation 6 their messiah is going to come as mentioned in revelation 6 which is the antichrist for us in the bible so um, the point is very clear their messiah is our antichrist so but in revelation 19 when you get to revelation 19 the rider on the white horse is jesus christ if you have any doubts he, you have the description here in verse 12 his eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns he had a name written that no one knew except himself again in the especially in the jewish uh, uh, culture you know name carries a lot of weight and also it represents the character you remember even god has to rename abraham abraham to abraham because names matter much so every name has a meaning so here what is saying is nobody can understand jesus name because his we can't fully understand him that is the reason so he is an infinite god he had a name written that no one knew except himself and verse 12 his eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns yeah i want to compare with that again one more time go back to revelation 6 and here if you look at it a crown was given to him in revelation 6 for the antichrist a crown was given that means somebody is giving him that crown he is not his own crown so and also he had a bow not a sword so the, you can clearly see the differences between the rider on the on the white horse in revelation 6 who is the antichrist and also now when you compare that with revelation 19 white horse the rider on the white horse jesus christ and now when we go to verse 13 he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of god so sometimes when people study this particular verse they immediately say what is this blood so that means they immediately say oh this blood is the blood that he shed on the cross no that is not what this blood is so i'm going to explain why so he was clothed with a robe but it looks like it's dipped in blood but this blood is not his blood that was shed on the cross so how do i know that so i'm going to explain in a bit and his name is called what the word of god 
and this theme the word of god is used elsewhere you know remember john the john the apostle wrote the gospel of john in john chapter 1 it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god so that is why now he is saying in revelation 19 his name is called the word of god so and he was in the beginning with god all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made so john is consistent in saying jesus christ is the word of god so he mentioned that in the gospel of john and also in the book of revelation and now in the verse 14 and the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen white and clean followed him on white horses remember the people who are clothed with fine linen those are the saints those are the righteous deeds that you know we earlier we studied so now and the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen white and clean followed him on white horses they are also riding on white horses but they don't have to do a war they don't have to do and come and fight a war because jesus christ is going to say a word you know so he is going to just handle by himself so the armies from heaven they are not going to do anything anyway and in verse 15 now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule with the rod of iron he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of almighty god in the previous chapters i explained what this winepress is i uh, you know whenever you see this term uh, his he treads the winepress what is this treading the wine press i explained that in you know with some images in the in the past in the previous sessions so i'm going to just allude to that again he himself now he is going to rule with the rod of iron he himself treads the wine press of the fierceness of the wrath of almighty god so what is he how is he going to do that so now we are going to see that earlier we saw that in revelation 14 remember revelation 14 when we studied revelation 14 uh, 19 i would recommend if you have not uh, watched the session 24 please go back and watch session 24 where i explained this in greater detail when we studied revelation chapter 14 so in chapter 14 verse 19 it says so the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the wine of the earth and threw it into the great wine press of the wrath of god and uh, in and then what happens this is the wine press as i showed you how they you know they bring in all this grapes they put it in and then they are going to uh, uh trample on that and then they produce this wine so it is i explained in detail how the uh, how it is explained the fierceness of the wrath of god so that somebody is trampling on this crushing these grapes when you crush the grapes what happens the juice will flow out and then they are going to collect the juice it is a kind of a expression that you know you are going to trample your enemies and the blood will flow out so that is kind of the expression that is uh, shown here and of course i showed you all this in session 24 explained the uh, the archaeology of the of all those details and in uh, verse 20 and the wine press was trampled outside the city and what happened instead of the grape juice because these are not grape god is going to crush these people and blood came out of the wine press uh, up to the horses bridles for 1600 furlongs so around 200 miles or 321 kilometers so so the, there's going to be a huge army that's going to come to fight again fight god fight jesus christ and when god is going to fight against them and god is going to uh, do the trampling um, and blood Come, comes out and that is what the uh, description given here we also studied this in session 24 i just alluded to one more time isaiah 63 verse 1 who is this who comes from edom with dyed garments from bozra this one who is glorious in his apparel traveling in the greatness of his strength i who speak in righteousness mighty to save and in verse 2 why is your apparel red you know earlier i said his uh, his garments are red dipped like blood in blood so the same question in isaiah 63 2 why is your apparel red and your garments like the one who treads in the wine press somebody in the treads in the wine press i explained in detail in session 24 you know your garments becomes red because you are tre- tre- uh, you are treading on the grapes and you know your garments becomes red 
So here, the, the rhetorical question, why is your apparel red? And the answer is because you know, I have trodden the winepress alone. This is Jesus Christ speaking in Isaiah, if you could uh, you know relate that. And from the peoples, no one was with me. So God is going to do alone. So, you know, he doesn't need any help from anybody. He's going to do it alone. For I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments. Do you see this? Very clear. The scripture explains why Christ's garments are dipped in blood. Because their blood is sprinkled upon my garments and I have stained all my robes. So God is going to, uh, uh, in his judge, in his anger, he is going to trample them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments and I have stained all my robes. So Isaiah meticulously has already described what is going to happen in the second coming. When Jesus Christ comes back, the reason why his garments are red, like dipped in blood, and he even explains whose blood is that. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments. So that is the reason why So uh, it, it makes sense there. And also in verse 4, For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. I looked, but there were no one to help, and I wondered that there were no one to uphold. Therefore, my own arm bought salvation for me. My own fury, it sustained me. So I explained this again in session 24, wherever you see my own arm, that is talking about Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, you, you don't find the name Jesus, but you will find that words like my own arm has brought salvation. That is Jesus Christ brought salvation. And Isaiah 63, 6, I have trodden down the peoples in my anger, made them drunk in my fury and brought down their strength to the earth. So God is going to judge the nations when he is going to come back. Also, it is going, nobody can withstand him. Verse 16, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written. King of kings and Lord of lords. So you can't confuse this. Who is the rider on this white horse? Because a name written clearly says King of kings and Lord of lords. Verse 17. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of the heaven. Come and gather together for the supper of the great God. This is kind of really remarkable. So you know. So you imagine Millions of people gathered together in the place called Megiddo. That is where you got this Armageddon, you know. So the, the, the billions of people uh, joined hands to fight against Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is going to come back and tread the, like the, just what we studied. Uh, uh, the blood comes out and, you know, up to the horses, bridles for 200 miles and all that. There will be so many people dying there. So now what is the angel proclaiming? Angel is calling all the birds of the sky. Hey, come on birds. So now we are going to enjoy a feast here. So that is what exactly it is. So then I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God. Because millions of people are those who are going to planning to fight against the Lord God Almighty, Jesus Christ. They are going to be killed. Verse 18, that you may eat the flesh of who? Kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of the mighty men, the flesh of the horses and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. So this is what in the end going to happen. The people are going to be killed and all the birds are going to feast on them. That is what the angel clearly says in 17 and describes that in 18 as well. In 19, verse 19, and I saw the beast... You remember the Antichrist, the beast, the false prophet? So here is the final mention of them. In verse 19, And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. So the Antichrist is going to bring all these kings and all these armies together to fight against God. And that is what's going to happen at the end. Then verse 20, Then the beast was captured. And with him, the false prophet. So the beast and the false prophet was captured. So let me read again. So verse 20. Then the beast was captured and with him, the false prophet, who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. The first occupants to the hell, the... 
the first occupants to the lake of fire are who the prophet the false the beast and the false prophet so these two it clearly says these two are thrown into the lake of fire you may ask so then what are the what about the other people who died without jesus christ so that is a different topic uh, you can search for my video about paradise i explained that in detail so here are the first um, people uh, the first uh, entries into the, the, the lake of fire these two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with the brimstone so we talked about the unholy trinity right the satan the beast the false prophet but now here it says these two were cast alive into the lake of fire what about satan satan was not cast into the lake of fire yet we are going to study that in the next session so here for now you remember the beast coming out of the sea in chapter 13 and here the beast is going into the lake of fire so that is the whole history of the beast that's coming out of the sea so the antichrist and the false prophet so the then the uh, verse 20 then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet and these two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with the brimstone so that's and there ends the career of these two guys verse 21 and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse so here we have the description how this uh, the battle of armageddon is going to end people may think all kinds of things oh there may be a warfare for a long time no not you know jesus is going to speak a word and that is how it's going to all end so if you want to really you'll be you know sometimes i wonder you know people will get even disappointed with the battle of armageddon because this is what how it is going to end verse 21 and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh so the angel is giving the clear details how this is all going to end revelation 19:21 thank you for watching uh, with this we completed chapter 19 so the beast and the false prophet now uh, entered into the lake of fire and we still have satan satan has not yet thrown into the lake of fire satan has still some time that is what we are going to study in the coming chapters so thank you for watching uh, if you are not subscribed to my channel please do subscribe and also if you like these videos please give a like so others can also uh, watch these videos and you can also visit my blog mydailydevotion.org thank you for watching <music>